Married, divorced, and single here, it's one family that mingles here. Conservative and liberal here, we've all got to give a little here. Big and small here, there's room for us all here. Doubt and believe here, we all can receive here. LGBTQ and straight here, there's no hate here. Woman and man here, everyone can here. Whatever your race here, for all of us, grace here. In imitation of the ridiculous love Almighty God has for each of us and all of us, let us live in love without labels. My name is Jen. I'm one of the co-pastors here. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Tonight we are starting a new sermon series entitled Intertwined. Paula and I will be discussing femininity and masculinity as it relates to people in scripture. It's our attempt here at Left Hand to gain a greater understanding of what healthy masculinity and femininity is. These are loaded subjects, and I'm hopeful that we can learn from one another, sparking conversations that maybe aren't the most comfortable. I'll admit, I have a lot to learn when it comes to our various expressions of feminine and masculine. And we've attempted to understand some of this here at Left Hand through our understanding of God. Many, many of us who grew up in the church have known God as Father, but that is not complete. Nor is it complete to claim God as mother. Each can be helpful depending upon one's own life story or present circumstances. And I know that I employ these gender binaries of God when it suits me in certain moments. And I don't think that there's a problem in that, but I also don't want to limit God to one or the other. And when it comes to Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, I am quite comfortable using the pronouns they, them, and theirs for God, he, him, and his for Jesus, and she, her, and hers for the Holy Spirit. And while it can still be limiting to put labels on things, it helps me to have context and understanding in this way. Maybe I'll evolve someday past this point, but for now it works for me. Our society has demanded that we define masculine and feminine. And often we define it in the gender that presents itself outwardly or the gender that we feel that we are. As a woman, I identify as primarily feminine. This, however, isn't always true. Despite my presentation, there are masculine traits inside of me that have been tamped down in favor of what I thought my conservative Christian upbringing required of me. And we can see how this tamping down, how it can cause problems because we need the balance. We need both the masculine and the feminine within our bodies and within our larger spaces and we can see that we suffer as a society because of this imbalance. We suffer in our homes, in our churches, in our healthcare, our education system, our government. It is harmful to favor one over the other, yet it's what has been done for centuries as the masculine has dominated for so long. The masculine is not wrong, nor is it bad. The masculine is beautiful and it's necessary, but when the masculine is not informed heavily by the feminine, when the feminine is deemed less than or weak or soft, the masculine can no longer express itself in a whole and healthy way. And this is the same with the feminine. The feminine must also be informed by the masculine. Here at Left Hand, we work really hard to try to bring that balance. And as you've probably noticed, that we can oftentimes skew towards the feminine. The pendulum swing is real as we try to make up for this imbalance. But please know that it is on our minds. As a woman, however, who does tend more feminine, this is a place in which I can breathe. It's a place that I can be. And when people say they feel something different here, I oftentimes wonder if it's because they can feel the feminine. So this sermon series is our attempt to identify these feminine and masculine characteristics in Scripture. We want to tease out in both males and females these characteristics and strive to strike the balance that we all need so desperately. 
And I hope through this identification, you will be able to see some of the masculine and the feminine within yourself that maybe you have tamped down one or the other because of socialization or expectations or whatever the reason. I hope that we can move into wholeness together, identifying the parts and pieces that we've had to hide or minimize. I had to tamp down my masculine characteristics. I was a wannabe tomboy as a little kid. I wanted to be an athlete dreaming of competing, but I fell into the notion of what I thought it meant to be a good Christian woman. And once I started puberty, that messaging grew and persisted. And the feminist movement was happening all around me when I was a kid, and I heard things growing up about how terrible it was. I brought this into my marriage and into my motherhood, adopting a complementarian idea of Eric's and my partnership. I believed that it was my duty to support and uplift my husband and honor him in all the ways. And we fell into a relationship of fairly strict gender roles. I took care of the kids, the food, and the house. He made the money and fixed things and took care of the cars. And it worked until I realized that I wanted a career. I wanted something more than just being at home. I wanted to challenge myself in new ways, and I wanted to be a mom and something else. I'm thankful for this church that allows me to pursue my gifting and my calling as a pastor. This is very, very important to me. And I pray that all stay-at-home parents or caregivers can be uplifted in the same ways because the world does need our expertise and voices. But I didn't question my role as a Christian woman for a really long time. And, un and until this past year or so, I didn't question my role in my marriage. Needless to say, challenging those gender roles within my marriage has been very hard work, and I still have to fight the urge that my worth is pinned upon my feminine expression. But as we work on it, Eric is finding more of his femininity, and I am finding more of my masculinity, and it feels good to be pursuing balance within our home and within our marriage, within our, within our relationship with our kids, and in our personal lives. And as a pastor, I've entered into a world bent upon the masculine. It's been an interesting journey as I actually loathed my feminine expression. I didn't understand how to show up in meetings. I didn't understand that my feminine expression was important. It hadn't been modeled for me. And if I were to step into a traditional evangelical context at this very moment, I could not lead from the pulpit. I could not be a preaching pastor. So what do we do? Those of us who have gifts, who have a call, but it's not welcome because you identify primarily as a female, as a feminine. The only way I could figure out was to go around. I recently watched an interview with Democratic freshman U.S. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who unseated the 10-term incumbent in the Bronx. When asked in this interview if she participated in any of the traditional Democratic Party activities that were happening, she chuckled and she said something to the effect of, no way, are you kidding? They would have laughed me out of the place. I had to go around. Today, as we look at Exodus 1 and 2, we discover some women who went around. At this point in history, the Israelites are dwelling quite comfortably in Egypt. Joseph and his brothers settled in Egypt, and the promise that was given to Abraham is starting to come true. And the nation of Israel is becoming full of Abraham's descendants. The Hebrew people are thriving in Egypt. Their numbers are growing at an alarming rate. They're comfortable, they're safe, and they are making babies left and right. But times are changing. Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives 
bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. Things are really, really rough for the Israelites. Pharaoh's jealousy and fear has got the better of him. He did not know Joseph in the ways that Joseph served and protected Egypt. Or better yet, he chose not to know Joseph in the ways Joseph served and protected Egypt. I suspect Pharaoh was afraid of losing his influence, and instead of seek a therapist, he instead sought, sought oppression. The screws are tightening on these folks, and it is not looking up for them. But despite their oppression, they continued to grow in numbers. Babies were cropping up everywhere, but this only increased the hatred that the Egyptians had for the Israelites. But Pharaoh, he had a solution. Verse 15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Say their names, Shifra and Pua. These women were ordered to do a terrible, terrible thing, all by a Pharaoh whose name is not even mentioned. Israel was a patrilineal society. Society was organized through the male line. So if the males were wiped out, the people in their history would also be wiped out. And these midwives, they knew this, and they feared God. They trusted God. They trusted God more than they were frightened by what Pharaoh would do to them. These women were subversive. They knew that what the Pharaoh commanded was wrong. They knew their actions required them to go around the system. And through their actions, they saved hundreds of baby boys. When Pharaoh questioned them, they lied. These Hebrew women, they're superstars. Their babies pop out before we can even get there. And God honored this. God honored their trust. But Pharaoh, he was not done. Since that's not working, well, let's just throw all the baby boys into the Nile. Pharaoh knew the proliferation of the Hebrew people was not good for him. He knew someday he could be overthrown by a Hebrew male. So there's no better way to ensure Pharaoh's power than to kill the threat. We remember the same thing regarding Herod and Jesus the Messiah. This seems par for the course for insecure and cruel rulers who want to keep their people subjugated and oppressed for their own preservation of power. The story continues in chapter 2, verse 1. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and while her t attendants walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and uh, get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, 
she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. The Levites, the parents of Moses, were one of the 12 tribes of Israel. They were set aside early on, even during this Egyptian bondage, to do the spiritual and religious tasks. They were not required to do the backbreaking labor that the others had to do. You, were set, you could say they were set apart by God. The parents of Moses, we later discover, are Amram and Jochebed. Amram married Jochebed, his father's sister. So Amram married his aunt. And while incest is clearly not okay, we discover it's not just the women who are subversive, but it's also God. To utilize the offspring of this unlikely pair in the most remarkable of ways to deliver a people. I have played this scenario in my mind since the earliest memories of my Sunday school days. As a youngster, I envisioned a serene setting with a docile mother gingerly bending down to set her baby in a basket amongst the reeds in the Nile. The baby never did cry in my vision, and he just laid there as he floated slowly downstream, carefully bumping right up against the edge of the river to be found by a waiting princess. And now, as a mother of teenagers who knows too much and has seen too much, not just in my home, but now in my community and globally, I have a far greater concern for this mother and baby. The terror of muffling a baby's cries for three months for fear of being reported, knowing what the authorities would do, the sleepless nights, the long and eternal days, I remember trying to keep my kids quiet for two hours on an airplane, and all I could do was just feed and feed and feed and feed. As a mother, I imagine entrusting the baby's older sister, who probably wasn't that much older, to monitor him and make sure he was okay floating in that great big Nile. What did that conversation look like between mother and daughter? I can imagine it was terrible and heart-wrenching. The subversive act of Jochebed and Miriam, jo Moses' sister, leads to deliverance. Moses, who would eventually lead the Israelites out of Egypt and into the wilderness, ultimately to their freedom, did so because of this subversion. The strength of Jochebed to release her newborn was an act of faith because she trusted God. Hebrews 11.23 says, By faith, Moses was hidden by his parents for three months after his birth because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. There was something about Moses and his parents knew this. His parents knew that he was set apart. The feminine knows what needs to be done she finds ways to go around, and the feminine, while she may be trembling, she doesn't let it stop her. She knows what's important. She knows that edicts in terror are not enough. The feminine within each of us is hardly rational, and while she's subversive, her goals are always bent toward freedom. Her ultimate goal is liberation and deliverance, and she knows the work that she's doing may not come to fruition in her lifetime, but she does it anyway. Her goal is long, and her efforts are lasting and eternal. Abolitionist and minister Theodore Parker in the 1850s, you'll recognize this quote because Martin Luther King used it a little bit. He said, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience, and from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. The feminine knows to take the long view. She knows that she must release without knowing the results, and she fills as she fills and empties, she midwifes, and she delivers life into the world. The pushing and the pulling, it is her life. It is her existence. 
for Jochebed to release Moses. This is part and parcel of being a mother. And being a mother is entirely subversive. The act of nurture in order to grow something up and then let it go, this just goes against the order of things as she gently places her precious baby in a basket alongside her heart, gingerly in the river. And this femininity exists within each of us. We don't have to be parents, we don't have to be mothers to recognize this act of creation, of growing something and releasing it. The work of the feminine is to love wholly and entirely and completely and then to let it go. In ancient Jewish teaching, it is believed Shifra and Puah are actually Jochebed and Miriam. The subversion of a mother and a daughter to prevent the deaths of hundreds of baby boys and the subversion of a mother and a daughter to prevent the death of their son and brother led to the deliverance of an enslaved nation, a nation under the thumb of empire, of a cruel and a terrified ruler. Their subversion delivered life through freedom. They knew when to receive, they knew when to release, placing three-month-old baby Moses amongst the reeds, only to be discovered by their enemy, their enemy, their enslaver, their abuser, also listened to the feminine inside and defied empire and a cruel and terrified ruler by receiving the Hebrew baby. And the feminine could listen and respond to the request for assistance in the form of the baby's mother and sister, Jochebed and Miriam. The midwives, the mother and daughter, received the baby once again to be fed and nourished and instructed by his own family in the ways of the Hebrew people to eventually deliver an entire nation and lead them to the edge of the promised land. The feminine exists within all of us, The feminine dwells deep in both male and female and within gender binary, non-binary. The feminine is subversive, and this subversion ultimately leads to deliverance. Oscar Romero, in 1977, was appointed by the Vatican as the Archbishop of San Salvador. The power brokers of the Catholic Church thought that he'd be a safe bet, and he would lead the church according to their wishes. As tensions rose in San Salvador, just days after his appointment, a new president was elected through a blatantly corrupt election. Protests mounted, people were killed, and violence spread from the city centers to the rural communities. And outspoken priests who protested these abusive acts were attacked by police. And in in just three weeks after Romero's appointment, a dear friend, Father Grande, one of those outspoken priests, was gunned down. Father Grande served in one of these rural communities as a tireless defender of the poor and the oppressed. The death of his friend changed Romero from a quiet and subdued priest into a tireless and vocal defender of these oppressed people. He would not turn away from the least of these as he exhibited the mercy, the compassion, the love, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oscar Romero was assassinated three years later during San Salvador's civil war that claimed the lives of 75,000 people. Romero's work was subversive, working tirelessly for the liberation and the relief of the least of these, his own people. He was a midwife his life, an offering that he placed in a basket and he surrendered it downstream. I will close with his words. It helps now and then to step back and take the long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is another way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. 
We plant seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces effects beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for God's grace to enter and to do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between a master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. May we remember that this work is ours to tend to and to release, surrendering to the whims of a river with the possibility that it may or may not be returned to us in our lifetime. Thanks again for watching today's sermon at Left Hand Church. If you live in Colorado and would like to attend, we meet on Saturdays at 5 o'clock. If you'd like to contribute to Left Hand Church, go to lefthandchurch.org give. And if you'd like to send us a confidential prayer request, you can send it to prayer at lefthandchurch.org. Thanks again for watching.